It's early 1942, and on the beautiful shores of Oahu, Hawaii, the wreckage of Japanese aircraft floats gently in the waves. In the port of Pearl Harbor, there is carnage. Just months prior, the Japanese Navy launched a surprise attack with an aerial armada. Now, the mighty Pacific Fleet of the US Navy lies in a scorched, tangled ruin. Littered around the harbor are the towering hulks of once proud battleships, now half sunken and capsized. Over 2,000 Americans, civilian and military, have been killed. The Japanese Navy proudly reports a decisive victory. By their account, 21 American ships have been damaged beyond repair or outright destroyed, never to fight or sail again. But they are wrong. From the day of the attack and into the next year, an epic salvage operation was undertaken that would see all but three of the American ships repaired and put back into service. This saga would push dive teams and engineers to their absolute limits, working deep inside the hulls of the devastated warships that still contained the remains of hundreds of their trapped comrades and friends. Exposed to toxic gases, jagged and twisted steel and shifting, unstable wrecks, these men worked despite the enemy's perceived success. It would not be an easy job, and there would be some shocking discoveries in store. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and this is the true story of the most epic salvage mission of all time. In this two-part series, we'll learn how the salvage division worked at Pearl Harbor, and we'll find out how these brave men and their machines pulled off the impossible. This is how they salvaged the wrecks of Pearl Harbor. This is an extremely rare Japanese newsreel film, probably made around mid-December 1941, reporting back to the Japanese public about a monumental victory. A task force of Japanese aircraft carriers had launched hundreds of fighters, dive and torpedo bombers into the air, a massed armada of aircraft with a single target, the US Naval Station at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. It's one of military history's most infamous surprise attacks. Both countries were not at war, and in the past, had even enjoyed a good working relationship. Isoroku Yamamoto, commander-in-chief of the Japanese Combined Fleet, had actually conducted a tour of duty in Washington. In mid-1941, he began to strategize an attack that would cripple the US Pacific Fleet so the combined forces of Japan could quickly invade and secure the Philippines and the East Indies. With this much territory secured and the Pacific Fleet either destroyed or heavily damaged, Yamamoto thought it likely that America would stay clear away from a war in the Pacific. After the First World War, 70% of the US public had actually thought involvement in that conflict was a mistake. In 1940, 60% of the American public maintained that keeping out of actively fighting in the Second World War was the way to go. Yamamoto believed his attack would be so decisive as to give the US military a bloody nose, erode all public faith in the institution, and knock them out of the conflict for good. It was a bright, sunny Sunday morning on December 7th, 1941, when over the heads of busy sailors and staff at the various naval establishments across the Pearl Harbor base, there grew the increasingly loud drone of aircraft engines. 350 Japanese aircraft attacked out of that clear sunny sky, targeting installations and buildings, depots and hangars, but most importantly of all, the aircraft carriers, battleships, cruisers, and destroyers. The American Pacific Fleet, or at least a good portion of it, was tied up idly and in peacetime. That notion of peace was shattered suddenly and violently. Bombs bracketed the battleships, rocked them at their moorings, and set them on fire. Smaller warships like destroyers had their bows blown completely off. Flames roared and seemed to touch the clouds hundreds of feet up into the air, and within minutes, the peaceful scene was turned into an earthly incarnation of hell. The Japanese propaganda film proudly shows the ships that were targeted and presumably sunk. The bluster and pride at the attack 
hides an uncomfortable truth for the Japanese. The key goal had been to cripple the US Pacific Fleet, but the three critical aircraft carriers were famously away on the open ocean and were never located by the attack force. Despite this, from the air and in between the enormous plumes of smoke, the sight of nearly two dozen wrecked ships burning and half sunken must have been encouraging for the Japanese planners. With the port and its buildings still smouldering, the US Navy had to quickly take stock of their situation. To understand the sheer scale of the rescue and the salvage task ahead, we have to first review the damage and see just how many vessels had been hit. The American warships had mostly been moored in the harbour, with some in dry dock facilities undergoing maintenance. The Ford Island Air Base, in the middle of the harbour, had been hit hard, with many of its aircraft left burning and broken on the runway and in the hangars. Off the northern shore of the island, there had been a mixed group of warships. USS Tangier, a C-3 class cargo ship, survived unscathed. USS Raleigh, the light cruiser, had shot down five Japanese planes but was hit with a torpedo and she listed badly in the water, although she was still afloat. She was easily pumped dry, sent for repairs and back in action shortly after. USS Detroit, another light cruiser, had managed to get underway and knocked out several more Japanese aircraft. Despite a few strafing passes resulting in one injured man, she had survived unscathed and set out with the cruiser's Phoenix, St. Louis and two destroyers to hunt, unsuccessfully, for the Japanese attack force. Now, for the United States Navy, that was basically where the good news ended. Moored between Tangier and Raleigh was the massive Florida-class dreadnought battleship Utah. This 23,000 ton steel beast had been used as a training ship, but she was rocked by two torpedoes and began to rapidly flood. There was an orderly evacuation, but she rolled and completely capsized, trapping dozens of men inside her hull. On the southern shore of Ford Island, the situation was yet far worse. The area here was known as Battleship Row, where the heavy hitters of the US fleet would anchor. All of them were old ships, dreadnoughts from the First World War, which had been modernized in the years since. USS California was a Tennessee-class battleship of some 33,000 tons. She was hit with two torpedoes and a bomb, and settled on an even keel into the shallow water of the harbor, with a hundred men lost. USS Maryland was a Colorado-class battleship. She was moored with the Nevada-class battleship Oklahoma to her flank. When Japanese torpedo bombers began dropping their payloads, this meant Oklahoma, and in fact all of the battleships outboard of those which were moored next to the island, had to bear the brunt of the warheads. Maryland took two bomb hits with four men killed, but survived the attack with little flooding. The Japanese mistakenly believed she had been sunk. On December 30th, Maryland went in for repairs, modernization, and she was back in action by June 1942. Oklahoma, outbound of her, was not so lucky. Two torpedo hits amidships blew away whole chunks of her torpedo protection, a third penetrated the hull and flooded her machinery spaces. In around 10 minutes, the ship had taken around eight heavy hits and she rolled over onto her side, stopping only because her masts and superstructure had dug into the silt on the harbor's bottom. 429 of her men were killed. USS Tennessee and West Virginia, like Maryland and Colorado, had been moored in a pair as well and the results were similar. Tennessee, a class leading battleship, was moored inboard and she hadn't suffered any torpedo hits at all. But the explosions of ships around her had set her decks on fire, and then dive bombers had attacked from above with two armor-piercing bombs, which were probably actually converted battleship shells. They plunged through her decks and a turret roof, although fortunately they did not detonate within the crucial and volatile main magazines. Burning oil from other ships began to creep towards her stern, so her crew did their best to keep it at bay by turning the ship's propellers slow ahead, thus fanning the burning liquid away behind her. Tennessee was trapped, because around her, the other battleships were burning and sunk. Outboard of Tennessee was West Virginia, another Colorado-class battleship. She took no fewer than seven torpedo hits to her side and two armor-piercing bombs from above. A fire raged on her upper decks and the ship began to rapidly flood, but thanks to the efforts of Lieutenant Claude Ricketts, she didn't capsize but settled on an even keel. Fuel oil, burning on the water's surface, engulfed the ship and she burned for a full day. Her captain was killed by a bomb blast from the nearby USS Tennessee, and 106 of his men were lost. 
Ricketts was the ship's gunnery officer, and when his ship was hit and began to flood, he rushed to gather a contingent of sailors to open tanks and counter flood his vessel so she wouldn't roll. In his own words, he said, The ship was now listing so heavily that on the linoleum decks it was impossible to walk without holding on to something. I reached the third deck and went forward to the first group of counter flood valves. Billingsley went aft and got a crank for operating them. I told Rucker to counter flood everything on the starboard side until the ship was on an even keel. It was not long before the excessive list to port began to decrease. Rucker told me later that he had not previously received any orders to counter flood, but he and Bobbick decided that they should anyway, and they actually opened the valves to two voids. The final pair of moored warships on Battleship Row included the Battleship USS Arizona of the Pennsylvania class and the repair ship Vestal. Vestal was moored outboard of the battleship providing maintenance. Vestal was hit with two bombs that had actually been intended for the battleships around her, one of which roared through three of her decks straight down before exploding deep in her holds. Her crew had got to work on their anti-aircraft and three-inch deck guns, but then something cataclysmic happened. USS Arizona was moored inboard next to Ford Island. Now the battleships moored like this had fared well in the attack, but Arizona was the tragic exception. One of those converted armor-piercing bombs plunged into her decks, crashing down deep into the ship. Now this had happened to Tennessee too, but the bombs hadn't detonated, but on Arizona, they did. Seven seconds later, a plume of black smoke roared up through the ship's funnel as her insides suddenly and violently erupted in a massive explosion. Arizona's main magazines detonated with a flash that evaporated the ship's bow and showered debris over Ford Island and the other warships. Vestal's crew were blown overboard by the blast, her decks swept virtually clear, and fires put out by the shockwave. 1,512 men were aboard Arizona when she went up, 1,177 were killed in less than a second. She sank quickly on an even keel and came to rest, burning with thick smoke on the harbour's bottom, where the superstructure and forward tower sagging into the water. USS Nevada, a class leading battleship, was moored far ahead of the others. When the attack began, it meant that she could actually get underway because she wasn't hemmed in. She was hit by a torpedo, but the flooding was mostly contained. Now, the sight of a damaged battleship limping away, her anti aircraft guns blazing, marked her out as an important target to the Japanese aircraft. She was hit with at least five bombs, maybe as many as ten, which caused gas leaks, fires, and damage but she still managed to shoot down four or five Japanese aircraft in the process. She came to rest on the soft harbour floor, beached just off Hospital Point to prevent her from totally sinking. Now south of Battleship Row had been the dry docks, the Navy Yard and the district headquarters. Pennsylvania, Arizona's sister ship, was in dry dock number one, astern of the destroyers Cassian and Downs. The Japanese attempted an attack with torpedoes, but it failed. Bombs proved more successful. Cassin and Downs were badly hit, and they were set ablaze. The destroyers burned, and the fire spread to Pennsylvania. The quick-thinking dock workers flooded the dry dock to contain the flames, but they still spread into the magazines of the destroyers, and Downs went up. Pennsylvania received a bomb hit and some light damage, and the fire was eventually brought under control. She went to sea, and was repaired, ready for action again a month or so later. But Cassin and Downs were stuck, wrecked, and burned, against one another in the dry dock. Just over from those three had been USS Shaw, a Mahan-class destroyer. She was in a floating dry dock when she took three direct bomb hits which caused fires and opened her up to the harbour's water. Firefighting was unsuccessful and her forward magazines erupted too, blowing her bow and forward superstructure clean off and sinking her. Sota Yomo, a harbour tug alongside, was badly damaged in the explosion and sank as well. Ahead of the dry dock ships were the cruiser USS Helena and the mine layer Oglala. Oglala had been a passenger cargo steamship in the early 1900s, but then was converted to an auxiliary warship. She and Helena were moored in Pennsylvania's usual berth, and the Japanese attackers expected the battleship, a valuable target, to be there. To their surprise, that warship was in the dry dock, and the two smaller ships were in her place. A torpedo passed straight under Oglala and detonated on Helena's hull. The cruiser survived, but the smaller mine layer had her hull breached and she capsized in the water. Helena was bracketed by bombs, but survived the assault with 26 dead and 6 Japanese aircraft 
shot down. That was the butcher's bill. It had been a heroic display by the Americans. The warships, their crews taken completely off guard, had jumped straight to action stations and manned their guns, managing to bring down some 30 aircraft and damaging more than 70 others. But despite this valiant resistance, the fact was the Pacific fleet was now in a pathetic state of disarray with a mixed lot of sunken, damaged, burnt out and bombed ships all tangled up with one another and many containing trapped men inside who were still alive but entombed within the thick steel hulls. Something had to be done, and the Pearl Harbor salvage mission would soon begin, but first there had to be a rescue. Of priority was the removal of wounded men, many of whom had become overwhelmed by the strong fumes and dense smoke from the fires. But then, terrifyingly from the capsized hulls of Oklahoma and Utah, there came the sounds of tapping. Trapped men signaling for help with tools banging against the hulls from deep within inside. Within the confines of the ship's hulls, crewmen tapped out an urgent message, but they weren't confident of a rescue. The air was thick with dust and particles, and the tiny compartments were pitch black as all the lights had died. One Oklahoma sailor, Stephen Young, later recalled that we had no knowledge that any attempt at rescue was even being made until the first sounds of the air hammer were heard as dawn came over the islands. For these men, the next few days would be a claustrophobic, terrifying waiting game. Using Morse code, the trapped men inside Oklahoma guided rescuers and cutting teams from the naval yard, armed with acetylene gas torches, and they got to work, attempting to sear their way through the ship's underside and plating. But burning their way through the hull armor, which was up to 13.6 inches or 34 centimeters thick, was virtually impossible. The thinner plating on the underside was more fragile, but using the acetylene gas torches to cut through the hull here risked burning up oxygen inside the ship where the atmosphere was already incredibly hostile, with breathable air mixed with cork particles from insulation, gas fumes, and smoke. But even worse, almost the entire underside of the warship comprised fuel tanks that might combust if touched with flame from a torch. Compressed air and manual tools were used to break apart whatever plates they could, Fortunately, the working party had a copy of Oklahoma's general set of plans at hand, and it guided their efforts. USS Maryland's commander, Captain Kranzenfelder, assisted with the operations and described the efforts to help free the men. He said lines were rigged from the bilge keel at intervals along the bottom, telephone communication was established with the Maryland, an air supply line was quickly rigged from the Maryland to the Oklahoma, Strainers were removed from main injections and overboard discharge in an attempt to gain access to the engine room. Contact was established with two men entrapped in the evaporator pump room through a small overboard discharge connection in the hull. Food and water were passed down to these men. From information obtained from these men as to their location in the ship, and with the aid of the booklet of general plans, it was possible to determine the best locations to cut access holes in the bottom of the ship. At 8am the next day, December 8th, six men were released from deep within the ship's underside where the plating was thinnest, and the work went on. Cutting in the wrong places could release trapped air, causing rapid flooding that would drown survivors, or even worse, fuel might be ignited starting a flash fire. It was a dire job, but it had to be done. Banging sounds came from Utah too. A torch was obtained from USS Riley, and workers began to cut away at a lower part of the hull. Out of the hole popped fireman John Vason. It stayed at his post low down in the ship to help keep her lights burning. All up, from the 7th to the 9th, some 32 men were freed from the confines of Oklahoma's hull thanks to the tireless work of the naval yard men and their tools under the leadership of Hawaiian civilian worker Julio De Castro. Many of the 32 men were deep down in Oklahoma's hold, the radio room, the after steering room, the evaporator pump room and the number 4 turrets ammunition handling room. The survivors owed their lives to the efforts of their comrades, as well as an air pocket within the ship's underside, but dozens of their mates were less fortunate. Trapped higher up where the plating was thickest, they were locked inside with no chance of freedom. It was the same case with the other battleships too. USS West Virginia contained men trapped deep within its hull, but because she'd half sunk on an even keel, it was impossible to cut through the ship's thick belt armour in the side. Divers could be sent in from above, 
to cut their way through, but an attempt on the Arizona had almost killed a diver, so this kind of operation was forbidden. Deep within the West Virginia's hull, three men were trapped, and they tapped out their pleas for help almost all day and night. The ship was placed under guard, and it was said during the night, for days, and even weeks later, the tapping sounds continued from within until they finally quieted and then subsided altogether. With the rescue mission completed to the best of the Navy's ability, it became clear that 2,403 people were killed or missing, and critically, the Pacific Fleet's warships were unable to avenge their loss. Sitting scattered, burnt out, capsized and charred with the prized battleships, but early on it became clear that many of these weren't as badly damaged as the Japanese might have hoped. Just one week after the attack, salvage operations began. If the warships damaged at Pearl Harbor could be plugged, pumped dry and raised, they could be repaired and even put back into service to answer the challenge the Japanese Navy had set. On December 14th, Commander James M. Steele, the former skipper of USS Utah, was made commander of the salvage division at Pearl Harbor, and right away he had his work cut out for him. The salvage division's HQ was a simple shack near the waterfront, but from this humble base, a grand plan began to take shape. Working closely with all branches of the Navy, and especially the Navy Yard, the salvage division began to assign specific tasks to qualified officers. The idea was that each damaged or sunken warship was given a dedicated project officer, and then, under them were assigned designated specialist officers who would oversee very specific tasks. There was an officer assigned to all planned diving operations, an officer for removal and stowage of munitions, and an officer for all other ordnance. But the Navy knew it couldn't do it alone. Civilian companies came forward, especially civil engineering ones like the Pacific Bridge Company, who had themselves a good deal of experience in working with large concrete structures underwater, and their experience would prove invaluable for the task ahead. The first job of the salvage team was a surprising one. The attack on the harbour was over, but nobody knew if the Japanese would try again. The anti-air defences needed to be bolstered, and quickly, and there, in the harbour, lay battleships bristling with unused and submerged anti-aircraft guns. Divers suited up for the first time with their heavy helmet suits, men at the compressor pumps on the decks were there to provide a constant flow of fresh air, and they got to work down below, unbolting anti-aircraft gun mounts from their positions and retrieving ammunition from the ready lockers and magazines by the hundreds. As this was done, the salvage division began to plan the much bigger job of repairing and refloating the warships which littered the harbour. The plan called for a kind of salvage triage. Of course, it was easiest to start with the ships which had received the lightest damage. Repairing them temporarily and making them seaworthy at the very least would mean the salvage division could send them under their own power to naval yards on the mainland US for proper repair and even some overhaul. First considered for salvage was USS Pennsylvania. She'd been in the dry dock with the destroyers Cassin and Downs but had survived with some minor fire and bomb damage. Her propeller shafts and screws were realigned, and damaged anti-aircraft and secondary batteries were removed to be replaced with those from USS West Virginia, which was in a more seriously damaged state. Superficial shell damage and splintering was easily fixed by the naval yard workers, and on December 20th the battleship was ready to make steam. She set out for San Francisco, went in for more permanent repairs, and was finished, ready for training and action, on January 12th, 1942, just over a month after the attack. Helena was the cruiser which had been moored in Pennsylvania's place, with the small auxiliary warship Oglala moored alongside, and now capsized. Pearl Harbor's number two dry dock was new and in a state of incompletion, but it was quickly fixed up by the experienced Pacific Bridge Company, and Helena was put into it, the first ship to ever do so. The torpedo, which had blown out the ship's side and capsized Oglala, had left a sizable hole. This was patched with welded steel plates and a new pumping system which was fitted that could deal with any ingress of water on her impending journey. Helena set off for permanent repairs at Mare Island Navy Yard in California on January 5th, and by the 4th of July, 1942, the cruiser was good as new and ready for training and then combat. With the two lesser damaged warships clear of the harbour, the salvage division's attention now turned to Battleship Row where the pride of the Pacific Fleet lay battered and broken. These battleships each displaced around 30,000 tonnes, and patching them 
refloating them and repairing them would be a Herculean task. In the next video in this series, we'll explore the incredible engineering behind the monumental task. We'll see original colour footage of the operation in action, and we'll learn how America's battleships were brought back from the dead. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy. And I'll see you again next time.